Well, two decades later, another Penn State 8-0 season goes and drowns in the land of 10,008 lakes. But don't hit the panic button. Plenty of time left. And Indiana's coming to town. And for all of you who want to talk about the path to the playoff, get focused just like the team has to <laughs> on this game at this time. Indiana, Indiana, Indiana. The blue-white tailgate is next. Welcome everyone to the Blue White Tailgate. Great to have you with us. Steve Jones, joined eventually here by Jay Paterno and Todd Sadowski. But first, let's get rolling with the PSECU game update. Josh Sperber standing by with our pregame update. Saturday's ranked showdown against the Hoosiers is set for a noon kickoff, and the game will be televised on ABC. Inside Beaver Stadium, it'll be Military Appreciation Day. After their first loss of the season, Penn State has dropped to ninth in the AP poll and just out of the top 10 to 11th in the coaches' poll. In the college football playoff rankings, Penn State is out of the top four, but stays in the hunt at number nine. After serving a one-game suspension, Antonio Shelton will return to the starting lineup for the Nittany Lions, as will Micah Parsons, who missed the first series of last week's game due to a behavioral modification. If you are coming to Saturday's game, come join our tailgate. We'll be in Lot 18 right outside of Beaver Stadium, so meet members of our crew and enjoy some delicious food presented by Go PSU RV. All right, so they got a hot dog and a beverage. No yeah. green on the M's on the graphic. <laughs> I hear they're working on it. I hear they're working on it. Got to work on this thing. All right. Uh, despite everything that happens during the course of the game, they still, at the end, have a chance to win it. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, that's a resilient team. Uh, at the end of the day, they didn't quite get it done, and there's obviously been a lot of debate as to whether you go for two and the th all those kind of things without getting into that. Right. They still have a chance to win the game at the end, and that's a sign that you've got to mature group of kids. Newsflash, it's not easy to go undefeated in college football, is it? There's only a few teams that are left. And one of the things that I've struggled with when you look at the game is how much of this was Minnesota and how much of it was Penn State. And so obviously there's a little bit of both, but you got to give the Golden Gophers credit. They came out, they played really, really good football. They did a lot of the things that Penn State tries to do at winning. Mm -hmm. Steve, you talk about all the time, play with the lead. I talk about all the time, control the red zone or beat yeah. them in the red zone. Don't yeah. settle for field goals, get touchdowns. I mean, they have a big offensive line, time of possession, yeah. less turnovers. I mean, they did a lot of the things that they that leads to winning. Penn State has to get back to that against the Hoosiers, Jay. Indiana is playing, by the way, really well this season. They are 7-2. and two. But This series, you look at the numbers on the series, and you'll say, wow, look at that, except a lot of these have been really, really close games, Jay. In fact, the last time, uh, the first time Indiana played Penn State was in 93. They came in as the ranked team, yep. and they were higher ranked than Penn State. It was a wild game. They had a receiver with 200-something yards receiving, if I remember correctly. Uh, Thomas Lewis and, ended up and, being and Penn a first-round pick of the game. Giants. Yeah, and Penn State won the game, so hopefully history repeats itself. He caught a 99-yard touchdown pass in that game. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That'll get you close to 200 I, pretty I, quickly. I was, I was coaching the University of Connecticut, and I was like looking at the score going, how in God's name? I before the internet. <laughs> what do you think about this time? Well, I mean, look, you said they've been close. The last meeting was last year. It was 33 to 28. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to talk about their quarterback that's playing this week, Peyton Ramsey, and they've got some weapons on offense for Penn State, just like the Minnesota game. I think they'll be able to score points, but they have to play clean football in order to do so. So we'll see if this one is close or not. Noon Saturday cannot get here fast enough for James Franklin. We're eight and one. We're one of the you know, best teams in the country. Um, you know, probably doesn't feel that way around here right now. But um, um, no, we we dealt with it. We handled it. I mean, obviously, when you have success and you win, you're more confident. And when you have setbacks and you lose, it challenges that. But uh, we got a resilient group of guys and a resilient coaching staff and. Um, although we need the time to prepare Saturday, can't come soon enough. Jay, can a practice field be therapeutic for a team? 
Yeah, but we got to get him some Red Bull. He's got to pep up with, <laughs> when, he's, when he's talking like that. He's not selling me. But, no, I, I get where he's coming from. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing is – the best thing about football is that you have a game the next week. Yeah. Um, but the worst thing about football is you got to wait seven days for it. Absolutely. But – all their goals are still in front of them. Goal number one is to win the Big Ten East. Goal number two, go win Big Ten Championship. And then from there, see what happens. And the college football playoff is still a possibility down the road if you take care of your business Get in focused, front of you. would you? If you take care this of your business. Week, Let me finish. One right, that's right. There you go. Your <laughs> goals are in front of you. And you can't get there unless you win this game. Yep. Yes. Right? All right. Coming up, we'll take a look at Indiana. Tom Allen's team's done a heck of a job this season. We continue after this. All right, Indiana is one thing they don't have to worry about. They're bowl eligible. They're seven and two. They know they're going somewhere, and they're ranked going into this game. The architect of this has been Tom Allen. So let's get to our McClanahan's coaches file, presented by our good friends at McClanahan's Penn State Room in downtown State College. This guy has done a heck of a job. He believes in his program. He believes in his state as well. He's a former high school coach in this state, has great connections, and he's a very good defensive coach, Jay. No question about it. And I think one of the things that you look at Indiana playing uh, and watching them getting ready for the film room, their players are carrying themselves like they think they're really good. Yes. They are. They're not backing down. They're aggressive. They're tough, and they have an attitude that I have not seen in Indiana. Guy's very likable, isn't he? Tremendous energy, which is infectious with the team that, and that confidence that they believe in. And he's coaching his son uh, on the team as well. He's a linebacker for the team. How much fun are the Allens having right now? It is showing up for practice, and there you are with your son there too. So, look, they're having a great year. They haven't exactly knocked off and really been super sure. dominant in their wins, but they're checking off the list. They go through, and they've, they've racked up seven Ws. They have done a good job. Uh, Michael Penix will be out. He's out for the rest of the season, shoulder surgery. Peyton Ramsey will start. Great story about Peyton Ramsey. He is named after Peyton Manning. His brother Tanner is named after Joe Montana. His actual first name is Montana. <laughs> and his brother Drew is named after Drew Bledsoe. I mean, the, the family loves quarterbacks, guys. Good Lord. He's a 72%. I prepped for the game. What well, do you think? I just did the Georgetown game this week. Yeah, I said it's all I did was Georgetown. No. Uh, but this guy's an accurate quarterback, 72%. Yeah, and we'll talk about it in the film room. They set things up. They are going to, in lieu of the run game, they're going to show, throw a lot of spacing routes, a lot of underneath stuff, make you tackle guys. And uh, he's very, very good at it. In fact, there's better numbers than Penix does throwing the football. Did you just say he's really accurate? Because we just saw a quarterback that was yeah, pretty darn yes. <laughs> accurate in Tanner Morgan, 18 of 20. So 72% yeah. isn't exactly 90. But point taken, I mean, you know, they're going to get the ball out quickly. They're going to spread it around. Uh, you know, they're effective offensively. If you, if you give them some time or you give them, you know, some space and you don't get them in his face a little bit, they can they can sling it around. All right. This is, quote, the backup quarterback that's had a lot of starts in his career, okay? So, I mean, really, it's a 1A, 1B starter. Okay. Being ranked, though, for Indiana, Jay talked about 93 when what Bill Mallory was yeah. the head coach. Tom Allen has his team ranked. They're loving it. I told our team in fall camp that I thought they were a top 25 football team. You know, and I'm sure nobody else would even have said that. So that was and said in the privacy of our meetings. And but I told him that and, and I believed it. And you can believe it when you have some talent and they've got talent. Stevie Scott at running back. Very good. And Wap Fillier is he may not be the biggest uh, of a big group of receivers, but he plays big. Plays big. He goes across the middle, goes yeah. underneath, works on linebackers, takes big hits and breaks tackles and makes plays. So, yeah. Interesting uh, note I saw about the last time they were ranked. The show Friends debuted a couple weeks after <laughs> the ranking came out. Yeah. So it hadn't even hit the air yet, the show Friends. That's how long it's been for Indiana. But you mentioned the talent. You mentioned Stevie Scott. Look, we saw plenty of him. The Nittany Lions did last year. Only a sophomore. He's, he's strong. He's powerful. He can, he can handle the load. Um, so they've got a good balanced offense. And you mentioned the wideouts, uh, you know, with WAP not being the biggest one. They got a lot of guys that are 6'2 or bigger, and they just struggled. The, the secondary just struggled against some tall receivers with the Golden Gophers. Nick Westbrook, very good. Donovan Hale, very good. Veterans, seniors that can play. Peyton Hendershot, 
not named after Peyton anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Peyton Hendershot <laughs> at, at tight end, good player. And he's 6'4", 255, yeah. so he's got some size well as a sophomore. It, it, look, Peyton Ramsey's going to have some weapons to throw to. Jay, what was the stat? You said six different guys? Six different guys of 20 catches or more, and you compare it to Penn State, we've got two guys. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and one of them's a running back and one of them's a tight end, so they've spread the ball around. A lot of people you have to game plan for. Interesting on defense. They have a pair of shutouts this year, Eastern Illinois and Rutgers. They gave up, I think, what, three to Northwestern. Yeah. But all three of those are not very good offenses. Right. right. When they faced really good offenses, they have given up some points, but obviously enough to be seven and, seven and two. When you look at them defensively, Tom Allen's done a great job over the years as a defensive coach. What do you think of this group? Well, they're not getting turnovers. Not a lot of, not a lot of interceptions yeah, like we saw last week. Three. And we looked at you know the number of interceptions Minnesota had. But they're, they're generally good tacklers. Yes. Not great. They give up some things. So, again, it, it, they're going to make you be patient. They're going to keep things in front of you. And if you get frustrated and try and force things, then they'll make some plays. They also play that robber coverage, and that's where Marcelina Ball comes in. Yeah, and, and you know, they're going to try and take away the things Penn State's good at. I would imagine they're going to have somebody in the neighborhood on Hamler because a third wide out has – or second wide out has really yet to emerge for Penn State. So, you know, I expect them to force Penn State to – play left-handed. Well, and I think if, if Clifford can get a little bit of time, he can get a little bit more accuracy this particular week and just get his playmakers a little bit more space, I think Penn State's going to be able to move the ball and score. That's a team that has some sacks this year, 19. Alan Stallings leads them with four to this point. But they haven't put a tremendous amount of pressure on quarterbacks, and that's going to be, I think, one of the keys in this game. No question. And that last week, even though Minnesota didn't get there, they harassed Sean into a couple of, couple of mistakes. All right. So we'll take a look at Penn State's defense and the play of the linebackers will do that as we continue with more after this. We felt all season long going through that the Penn State defense had been, quote, one of the givens along the way. But Minnesota in the first half of the game, then Penn State adjusts in the second half. Jay, they did a good job with their unbalanced line, and it, and Penn State eventually did adjust to it. But, again, it took a while. Yeah, and I think the other thing, too, that, that, that helped is that Minnesota started to slow the game down the second yeah, sure. half. I mean, you hit 80, 90% right. of your passes, which is a, a record against Penn State. Um, that's, that's saying something considering Tom Brady's played against Penn State yeah. and Dan Marino. Yeah. I mean, the kid played a great game. And, really, the disappointing thing is – we didn't get hands on balls yeah. in terms of we didn't even contest some things. Right. But that said, they'll make some adjustments and sure. uh, see how they play this week. Well, like there were some player mistakes that happened. I mean, there was a bad angle taken on one of the first drives. For, you know, Garrett Taylor didn't get to Rashad Bateman, and he, and, he, and he scored, that type of stuff. Those things, they, they just happen. The secondary is a position that is a confidence position, right? I mean, you, you heard Drew Brees come and talk to his old alma mater, Purdue, we talked about through the DBs, play with some swagger, right? And so let's hope that the DBs get back out there and they play with a little bit of swagger and some confidence and, and regain it as a, as a defense. And, the, of course, the pass rush can help that as well. But Minnesota, again, how much credit do you give them? They really did a good job protecting Tanner Morgan, and Morgan was on target. I mean, they, they just, yeah. execution-wise, they did an excellent job. He was terrific. So let's look at the numbers. Uh, looking back on this game as to how it played out. I mean, 31 points for Minnesota. The rush yards, you expected Minnesota to run the ball. It's the 339 passing quote you didn't expect. And that 460 yards, uh, that's 80 yards short of what Penn State had in the game. That's uh, yeah. that, a lot of people realize Penn State yep. had 540 yards of the game. So now our Planet Fitness defensive player of the game brought to you by our good friends at Planet Fitness. And Jan Johnson, the linebackers actually played pretty well in this game. And Jan Johnson, you can see what he did with the 11 tackles, three for loss along the way. And he said after the game to Jack Ham and me, he said, look, I've got to talk to my teammates and let them know exactly what Todd said. Right? you got a lot in front of you here. Don't let one game define you. You can still get to your goals. No, no doubt about it. I mean, look, it, we have the luxury of looking big picture, right, and looking at, okay, here's the way the schedule sets up and all this time. They don't have that luxury. They've got to get back in the room. Sure. They've got to get back to business. They've got to get back to what, you know, the task at hand, and that's the Indiana Hoosiers. They're, they're more talented than them. They're at home. They should be able to take care of this team, but they cannot play too loose. They've got to, you know, they've got to get – ready and and see everything that's coming about them and they're also facing another team guys this is a third team in a row that has a bye week right. leading into the game and right. look 
you get out there and you have to go play the game. But that gives them an extra week of preparation to sure. do some things, throw in an unbalanced line, to do some stuff yep. when Indiana has nothing to lose when they're 7-2 and two and they're coming on the road. So we'll see what kind of wrinkles they throw in when they got an extra week to prep. Time now for our tale of the tape. Brought to you by our good friends at GoPSURV.com, where the green M&Ms will be flowing Saturday <laughs> for the tailgate party beginning at 10. That's the Penn State defense against the Indiana offense. You can see that, you know, the 446 yards right there, the 308 passing. Part of that's Penix, part of that's Ramsey. Yep. Uh, and the 138 is Stevie Scott. Uh, your thoughts? You know, and they're big receivers. Four of the five. Yep. Fillier is the one that is at 5'11", the short guy. Exactly. 5'11", <laughs> <laughs> the short guy. <laughs> but I, th I think the thing is going to be can Penn State control the short passing game. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I thought Minnesota did really well early in the game was Penn State was going to come after them to try and take the runaway, and they had success throwing the ball, and that really slowed down the blitzing the rest of the half because once you get beat a couple times in those, you're a little hesitant and gun-shy, but um, they're going to have to be patient and just kind of make the tackles. What, exactly. You just t took the words right out of my mouth at the end. It places the premium on tackling, and that's the good thing about the linebacker unit and Jan Johnson and Micah Parsons, you know, Cam Brown. They, they've been doing a good job of, of getting the guy wrapped up and getting him down so that he doesn't get too many extra yards and make him, you know, short situations on third down. A guy that's been stout all season, very hard to move off the line of scrimmage, and does a good job of setting up the linebackers, is Antonio Shelton. He had to sit out of the game with a one-game suspension, but for James Franklin this week, he's back. I actually think we missed Antonio's leadership on the sideline as much as we missed his, you know, his presence on the field. Uh, he's a smart guy. He's a vocal guy. He's a loud guy. Um, and... and is not afraid to, to speak his mind on the sideline. And it also gives them a good rotation there in terms of the ability to split up plays up front. Well, one of the things that tires out of defensive line more than yeah. anything is constant pass rush. And they're going to see a lot of passes. And a lot of them are going to be quick. We'll talk about yeah. in the film room how quickly they get the ball out, and it can be frustrating. So from a mental and physical standpoint, it's good to have that rotation. And, and Todd, that's Stevie Scott. They've got to make sure that he doesn't get into a rhythm at running back. Which they've been able to do. I mean, they do, they've done a great job against, against the rushing, rushing attacks. And that's part of the reason why some of the passing numbers aren't skewed, but a little bit higher, because they have forced teams to have to throw the ball against them. And it, look, it never hurts to have more bodies. So it's, great. Right. it's going to be great to have Shelton back in there. No question. And Stevie Scott's also very good in the pass game. And that's something that has to be kept in mind. They do spread the ball out. You just just can't lock in on a guy and say, we got the guy. Right. No, you don't have the guy. They, they got this guy, <laughs> this guy, this guy. All right. Coming up, we'll take a look at the Penn State offense. They did ring up 540 yards in the game. Once they got going, they got going. And so will we after this. All right, welcome back. So let's uh, take a look at it numerically as to what happened Saturday with the Penn State offense matching up. And you can see, you know, they racked up yards, right? Third downs, no problem. The interesting, though, in the pass yards, Penn State ended up in this game with 291 yards on first down. But on their first 11 first down pass attempts, they only hit two. Then they hit all of them. Right. After that, in the second half of the game, once they got that part going, Jay, it made a big difference. Well, what happened was the question on the full screen, turnovers. Yes. And the story. I mean, Penn State has, if you look at the last three games they won, the turnovers have been the key plays that got them the key no points question. to win the games. And this particular week, they made turnovers in key parts of the field that they have not been doing. And you know what? When you got a first-year quarterback, he's going to hit some into the woods on occasion, and you still were in a position to win the game at the end of it. If you're creating an outline, underneath that is red zone and red zone execution. And, you know, I really don't question a lot of what happens out there because, you know, execution is the key. You call a play thinking it's going to work. But I think there were some situations in the red zone they're going to probably rethink and, and try a little bit. They did a couple of fades to K.J. Hamler, who's not the tallest guy, and maybe not Fryermuth to avoid Winfield, whatever the situation may be. But when you don't have success in an area, you go back and you reassess. So I think they might try and do a few things differently yeah. in, in the red zone. But they got there. They just didn't plug it in for six. And going into that game, they'd only missed twice in the red zone all yeah. year. One was a missed field goal, and the other one was yep. it was the end of the game, and the ball ran to the 17-yard line to end the game. 
So they've been completely successful in the red yeah. zone until you get to that that game, and then that game it didn't. It and didn't. once again, we talk about Minnesota. They kept talking yeah. about Minnesota. Look, one of the teams that's least penalized in the country, yes. right? They don't kill themselves that way. They get into the red zone. They're number one in in touchdown yeah. conversion. They didn't. They hadn't even settled for a field goal. They had a great package where they brought in the big guy from the wildcat position, finished it off. They yeah. did a lot of really really nice things right. in that particular game, and Penn State just didn't do quite enough to come away with the W. Bobby Ray Hall, Drive of the Game, brought to you by our good friends at Bobby Ray Hall Honda. And let's take a look at this Drive of the Game. There are going to be a couple different parts to it. First of all, Sean Clifford, right? So he's going to fire it, and there is Antoine Winfield. Two picks in the game, giving him seven on the season. And this then set up Minnesota. Tana Morgan, who just had a phenomenal game. That is, you talk about three guys that do a heck of a job on a play, okay? Morgan, great job. Johnson, great job. Keaton Ellis did a great job. And yet, perfect execution leads to a touchdown. Sometimes you just can't do it. I yeah, mean, it, you, he makes the right throw. And even going back to the interception in Clifford's defense, the, the pick, blitz pickup was horrendous. He had a guy in his face, yeah, yeah. and that really led to the interception. And it's funny because those two plays we just showed really kind of tell you a big story about the game and about Sean yeah. Clifford's game and what happened. His throw to K.J. Hamler did not get to the outside, away from the safety that was coming over to help. Tanner Morgans did get over to the outside, away yeah. where the only place it could go and the only person that could catch it was the receiver. Yeah. Those little nuances, those little differences played a really, really big factor. I think that's what happened to Sean is his touch was just a little bit off in this game. He didn't get it in the yeah. spots that he wanted to. And if he had time, I mean, there was yeah. times where he just didn't have time. Finger hit the helmet, that kind of stuff. And as we said last week, and we were emphatic about this, Johnson and Bateman would be playing on Sundays yeah. down the road. Well, I hope you understand what we were talking about on the show last week. All right, so let's get to the Penn State wide receivers. Josh Sperber takes a closer look at this critical group. Something that was made very evident in last week's loss is the need to spread the ball around in the passing game. We've also missed some throws. You know, we threw some balls into the ground. We threw a post to open the game um, that we got to lead the guy so he can run away with a corner on his back hip. That gets spread around. We got to find ways to get those guys involved in a little bit more early in games. As expected, KJ Hamler and Pat Fryermuth have been getting the lion's share of the Nittany Lions receptions. But how much is too much? The pair have combined for 44% of Penn State's receptions and 48% of Penn State's receiving yards. Coach Franklin says the impetus is on the coaching staff to bring out that level of playmaking in the other pass catchers. At the end of the day, when the ball comes, you, you got to make the plays. Um, and we have all of the faith and confidence that, that we can do it and that they can do it. We just got to bring it out in them more. That has happened this season, but sparingly. In each of the past four games, Hamler and Fryermuth have provided for more than half of Penn State's receiving output, including over 60% of Penn State's yards and receptions last week, while complementary receivers like Justin Shorter and Daniel George struggled. We got to build their confidence up and we got to build their fundamentals and skills up so they make those plays rather than spending so much time on, on uh, what they didn't do. In the home stretch of the regular season, with a potential spot in a major bowl game on the line, additional receiving production could make a huge difference. All right, so now the part of it, too, is the running backs. And let's get to our Planet Fitness Offensive Player of the Week, who had a career-high 124 yards, brought to you by our good friends at Planet Fitness, and that is Journey Brown. What are you seeing in Journey Brown, Jay? Well, I think he gets in the open field. He's making big plays. I mean, right here he gets loose, and it's, it's seven points. And that's important when you get that kind of uh, blocking up front. And a little bit better runner inside than people realize. Made the first guy miss a couple of times, which is huge for him as a home run hitter with that sprinter speed that he has. If he can get past the first guy and get through and get to, out to the into the secondary, well, he can really cause some damage. And he is our Offensive Player of the Week. So now let's get to the tail of the tape between the Penn State offense and the Indiana defense to this point. And on the tail of the tape, brought to you by GoPSURV.com. Green MMs available Saturday. Uh, you can see the what Indiana's given up this year. And only 176 passing along the way, which is an impressive number. And only 310 yards, Jay. Yeah, people talk about Indiana's offense, and they, they are a good, solid defensive football team that's going to make you be patient, and it's going to make you – they're not going to give up the big plays a lot, and uh, you got to adjust to that. And part of the Indiana adjustment is they're going to have to go against uh, Sean Clifford. So what does Tom Allen think of the Penn State quarterback? 
Clifford kid is just a really, really tough competitor. I mean, he, he really, that's where he's so much like the, you know, McSorley was such a tough kid, competitor, just always found ways and can beat you with his leg, beat you with his arm. I mean, he's just a very, very talented guy. And, and Clifford has to keep rolling like he did in the final quarter and a half at Minnesota. Yeah, I th he needs to play better, and I think he will play better. He's going to be in a comfortable environment. He's going to be fired up. You saw as he got on the field for that last drive, he was really, really excited and fired up with the team, emotional, just didn't quite get the job finished in Minnesota. They're going to try and get that done, obviously, with the Hoosiers. In the film room, we're not going to see Gene Hatton, are we? No. <laughs> just, want to make sure. <laughs> just want to make sure the film room is coming up now. Time for all of us to get a little bit smarter here in the film room with Jay Paterno. It is brought to you by Beer Bellies Beverage. And the subject this week is the Hoosiers of Indiana, now ranked for the first time in 25 time. years or so. And there's good reason to be ranked. This is a good team coming yeah, they've to done Happy some good, Valley. They've done some good things. And, and you know, it's going to be one of those games where Penn State fans don't anticipate just blowing this thing wide yeah. open. You, it's gonna, it could be back and forth. But let's talk about some of the hidden factors and take a look at the first screenshot we got here. Here's some things. Everybody wants to talk about Indiana's offense because they are very good. But look at how they rank on opponents' third downs, pass defense, total defense. And down below you see 50% of all their punts have been downed inside the 20. That's a really good number with just two, back, two touchbacks. But let's talk about how they do it on defense. They're going to play you with six in the box. Penn State's a one-back team. And usually with six in the box, you're going to run the ball. But one of the things they do is they're going to key with that safety backside. He's going to key tight ends for blocks. And he ends up becoming the seventh guy in the box. You're going to have to get K.J. Hamler to attack this matchup because people have, have taken advantage. But let's take a look at how that comes out on the video here. Again, here's the run, the tight end blocks. There's the safety up around the ball. And then forces the cut back into linebackers on blocks. So Penn State's going to have to you know, gain a four. Second and six is going to be a good play if you run the ball against this defense. You've got to be patient. Now, the next thing you've got to do is you've got to attack this. I mentioned attacking the slot defender and the safety with play action. They get the backside safety to come up. That leaves you one-on-one -on -one over the top on the safety. And take a look at how Nebraska takes advantage of this. Again, good hard play fake. Linebackers on the line. Backside safety's playing run. And there they go right by. And I can tell you, Spielman is a good receiver from Nebraska, but he's not K.J. Hamler. He's close, but not quite. So Penn State's got to take advantage of that. Now, once they get you playing patient, if you start to get on a rhythm, now they're going to change up and blitz you, and they've got a good blitz package. Here is a hot blitz, as evidenced by the red here. Again, so they're going to drop this backside guy, drop him, play coverage, but they're going to give you an overload blitz to the side, which gives you protection problems, and it also is a good rundown blitz. So take a look at this on the video, and you see now you've got the inside linebacker coming around outside, you've got the outside linebacker, and the backside linebacker really sprints his rear end off and gets over and makes a tackle. Now on third downs, they'll give you some change-ups. And here's another overload blitz. We're going to bring two linebackers to a side, which again creates hot situations for you and matchup problems because now your backs have got to pick up, and that was a problem. And now you're going to get one-on-one -on -one outside, and you've got to take advantage of that. Now let's take a look at how this blitz comes at, at Nebraska here. Again, they bring the backside linebacker, bring the, under, uh, the other linebacker underneath, and now Nebraska tries to run the ball, and there they're in great position to make the play. And that's why they're a good third down defense. Struggle will probably be with the personnel. Penn State has yeah. better personnel. We'll see. I think they're going to be able to score points. Let's say they can. But can Indiana's offense keep up with Penn State against what is now a motivated defense for the I Lions? Hope, I hope they can't, but let's take a look at how they get it done. And if you look at the first screenshot here, a lot of things through the air. We've mentioned it before. Six players with 20-plus catches. 69.6% .6 completion percentage. Eighth in the country. Only 13 sacks allowed, second in the conference. And one little extra tidbit, their field goal kicker is 13 for 13. So you don't want them to get in the field goal range. Now, that said, some of the things they do that are patient, make your defense patient, are what we call spacing routes. So here, are, you're going to see everybody go short. You've got an out here, a quick hitch here, a quick hitch here, a quick hitch here. you got the tailback here, and the ball comes out in 1.5 seconds. Take a look at the video. Again, nice, easy spacing routes. They get it, to, they, as I said, they move the ball around, 
There they get to the receiver, and that to them is a run play. That's second and two. That's a good play for them. Penn State's got to adjust, but be patient. Make those tackles. The next thing they will do is they will move the launch point. Again, when you play a good pass rush team, which Penn State's been a little consistent, but they have shown the ability to get to the quarterback, here they're going to aggressively pass protect gaps on the edge. They're, instead of the normal launch point where that is, he's going to move on, on the move and throw the ball from outside to so take a look at here on the – on the uh, on the video here again the nebraska guys will get sucked inside thinking he's going to be in the pocket he moves and now he finds his his best wide out on the move for a gain of 20. on third downs they're going to work matchups and because they have so many talented receivers they can get receivers on linebackers and on safeties so they like the inside matchups the penn state linebackers can be challenged because they're going to attack the middle of the field take a look at this third down play where they get him take a look at the video the third guy in the slot is on a linebacker. If you, even if you're in a nickel, he's still on a linebacker. And again, he gets down the middle, works inside that guy. On a third down, they get a big first down. The other thing, again, crossing routes were a problem for Penn State against Pitt. The, we talk about the six guys that have receptions. The running back is part of that as well. So take a look at this one on the video too. Again, nice easy throw out to the tailback. He gets outside. They get all those crossing routes, get a little bit of a pick, and now they got a first down. If only there was a resource we could go to to, to talk more about football and learn some more information. Uh, our relics continue in the 150th anniversary, yes. and we got something from Vince Lombardi. And today, this is the book called Vince Lombardi on Football, two volumes. I mean, I'm surprised this is all it is, given all he knows. But <laughs> things like the Packer sweep, and you can see it on the screen, uh, these are things that, uh, again, just the history of the game from 1973 shows you how important this game is to America. Tried and true methods of Vince Lombardi. He's got his name on the trophy after all. So He won a few. That's right. That's the <laughs> filmer. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Great to have you with us. Penn State has a lot of great beat writers that cover this program. One of them is Mark Loganridge from the Allentown Morning Call. Mark, welcome. Great to have you with us. I appreciate it, Steve. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's start with Sean Clifford. What have you seen in the body of work, and have you seen enough in the body of work that tells you that he has it that to bounce right back and get them everything back on track? Yeah, I think he's got the headspace and the capacity to do it. One of the things that I think you've noticed, and I'm, you know, I've seen this with quarterbacks all through the years. Is that it shows up in their feet that they start their emotions kind of get, and I'm sure Jay's seen it too, um, coaching quarterbacks. Their emotions get tied into their feet. They just get anxious. You can see it the way they move. And I, that that one thing I'll be curious to see um, how he comes out against Indiana. I think he's got that personality that freights everything on his shoulders, which then, again, that energy translates to the feet. They get moving. They get over-eager and over-anxious. And they get ahead of themselves. Quarterbacks will do that uh, in just, I, I think, in general. I think he's done that this year. It hadn't really been an issue necessarily until until Saturday at Minnesota when I don't know that in that game he was. I don't think in that game he was maybe over-amped. Um, I think he just made a couple of mistakes that were really amplified that he even mentioned after the game. And I think that overwhelmed some of the really good plays um, that he made. I thought uh, you know, some of the throws that he made, you know, he made a great throw in the end zone that was dropped. Um, turned around, came back to you know, tight end Nick Bowers, really good touchdown pass to him. He bounced, I think, in that game and – I think, you know, had they had another minute or two, he would have bounced one more time, yep. <clears throat> excuse me, from the last interception. So I, I do I do see him getting past that. It's just a matter of when he gets the, when he flushes out, I think maybe uh, some of the uh, over-eagerness of getting back on the field Saturday. Mark, this is Jay. Uh, just, a, just your thoughts in terms of the secondary. You know, we've talked on this show for a number of weeks that mm. we felt like this was a vulnerability Um how have you kind of seen them progress, and where do you feel like they're going to go from here? Well, you saw that it was a vulnerability. I thought against Pitt, um, some other teams have had success with that throwing. One of the things that uh, I thought Minnesota, I, I, I mean, that's nobody's ever thrown for 90% completion percentage against Sensei. I think their previous record was something like 84, and that's on 20 completions. Um, 
I don't know if I would necessarily lay that entirely on the way the secondary played and the way they covered. They left too many open gaps and 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 you know spaces to, to, to for for Minnesota's receivers to get to the point to give um, Tanner Morgan just that one hop throw or that, that one read throw that he was making that entire first half. I think some of the coverage maybe that you saw, and not an expert with this, it looks like some of the guys are maybe caught in between, uh, in between um, the coverages that they, you know, not everybody was in the same coverage at the same time. They maybe a receiver, you saw a cornerback going with somebody that, or letting somebody go that maybe he was supposed to go with, or vice versa, or just leaving that big zero space in the middle of the field and then missing a tackle. I'd like them to see, and not, not it's not necessarily their style, um, but maybe I'd like them to see if they're going to they're going to try to you know, to the blitz pattern. Maybe just give the corners a little more leeway and playing up tighter, getting them uh, a little more room, or if they're going to zone, just get, make sure everybody has their zone. Um, I thought they'd been pretty good tackling um, until that until the last game. There was that one wide receiver screen that there were a bunch of missed tackles on. I, and, and, you know, the one touchdown, um, I don't remember the receiver who it was, but Keaton Ellis, they had terrific coverage on The kid caught his kind of ball off his face mask. And other times, you know, the, the, you know, when they, when Minnesota, I haven't seen three receivers that year or this year that good. And I think Indiana's got some good receivers too. But when, you know, these guys are, you know, that skilled, they're going to make a play, a one handed ball off, off their helmet, off their face mask. Coverage can be great, and they can still. John Reed had that happen to him earlier this year. He had great coverage, and the kid, the kid just made a play. I'd like to see them, I think, keep um, a little more, uh, maybe tied a little tighter to the receivers so that, you know, you're playing ball. If, if they're gonna, if Indiana's going to throw some similar routes, do some similar things, that they're making tackles on the ball, and there's not a whole, there's not as much free space for a guy to catch and run with the, with the, with the way Minnesota seemed to have. Hey, Mark, we got about a minute left. I wanted to ask yeah. you about, you know, look, we can go big picture. We've all been kind of part-time therapists this week <laughs> after the, the team lost. Give us a reason why they can still win out. Their goals are all still in front of them, but give us a reason why they can win against Indiana and Ohio yeah, State and accomplish their goals. Well, but, you know, back home first time in the month, and I think that's going to mean a lot with Indiana. That to me, this is a really important game. This is an incredibly important game for them just to get their feet back underneath them and, and – and it's a game that, I don't know, does, dare you call it a must-win, I guess, for a program, because after the last couple of years, having lost back-to-back games, you know, the second time being worse than the first, uh, I, I think that, I think it's a decent matchup. But Indiana, again, I think Indiana tests them uh, with, with the passing games. That's good for them to be able to come back out, uh, for their defense to be able to come back out and try to test that again. As far as Ohio State, I haven't, aren't, you know, haven't essentially outscored Ohio State, I think, the last two years. I don't know the exact number, but I think it's something like 89, 88, or whatever it is, 88, 85, something like I mean, this, this is not a game that you should be in fear of, even though it's in Columbus and Columbus, or, you know, Ohio State is tearing people up. Well, I don't think it's a game that they should necessarily fear, so I think we're going Mark, into it with good headspace. Mark, appreciate it very much. Yeah, thanks, so thanks much. for having me. Appreciate it. See you Saturday. We'll come back with more after this. All right, welcome back. Here we go with the G Block. Eventually, some picks along the way, some keys to the game. First of all, James Franklin addressed a couple of items at the end of his press conference on Tuesday. At the end of the day, here, here's the thing I struggle with. Um, a lot of these decisions are not clear cut. There's some that are, but there's a lot that are not clear cut. It's a gut feel. And what I struggle with is when those decisions, and again, I already told you, the two-point charge said go for it. The analytics stuff said go for it. But then opinions are stated as facts. And, and I struggle with that. And so he talked about that in the press room on Tuesday. Well, Coach has his finger on the pulse of what's going on with the media, and he knows what's being said and sure. written about, and he keeps tabs on a lot of that stuff. That day was like a root canal, wasn't it? After a loss, you go out on a Tuesday, yeah. and it was let the second guessing begin and end yeah. on the same day. So Coach addressed it, talked about it, and then let it go, and didn't want to hear another thing about it the rest of the week. But those after losses, man, those Tuesday press conferences, they're not exactly fun. But here's the thing. 
You get paid a lot of money. You're going to get second guessed. People are going to yep. express opinions. Sure. Fact. Don't even address it. Don't get in a pissing contest with a skunk because you're not going to win. So you know, I, I appreciate what, what he's trying what? to get, but let's just go on. And why worry did, about why the next one. Why did you one. look at me when you said that? <laughs> <laughs> Because you're a skunk? No. <laughs> but no, a wise man just to, can I say that on TV? I don't you know. I can't yeah, just yes. did. But I mean, it's great right. advice, and right. it, it, believe me, it's something yeah. I've carried with me my entire life. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. And I, and I yeah, think that would help. Just, just, just to let it go. The media's yeah. going to attack you no matter what. You go 11 and 1, they're going to talk about the one. Okay. Time now for the good, <laughs> the bad. And I can't believe that of all people, Sadowski got the ugly. Mm -hmm. Jay, you are good. I got the good, and I'm going with the Baylor Bears. Matt Rule, I coached yeah. at Penn State, is a great, great coach, and really is a detail-oriented guy, and it's really paying off. They have had five or six one-score wins. They came back, beat TCU, and they got Oklahoma this week, and I'm rooting for the Bears. Uh, I get the bad, and uh, Chase Young at Ohio State, uh, because... This is really murky, and the story keeps changing as to why they needed the money. Well, why the money was needed for this. No, it was actually to send the parents of the Rose Bowl. Now it's to send the girlfriend of the Rose Bowl. Okay, you got to get your story straight, and then maybe you can get yourself cleared. Okay, I get the ugly. I wish I had the good, though, because I would have said how entertaining college football was on Saturday to watch the Penn State-Minnesota game. I did not enjoy watching them lose, don't get me wrong. But the LSU-Alabama game was phenomenal and a lot of fun to watch. The ugly is Maryland's defense. Look, they've lost seven out of eight. In those seven losses, they've given up 316 points, averaging 46 a game that they're giving up. And it, it's not getting any better for the Terps. It is bad. That does put a lot of pressure on your offense. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get to our picks presented by the Center Daily Times. Let's see how our intrepid group has done to this point. Still can't go. Oh, doggone. Oh, man. I was, well, I was awful. <laughs> I was I'm awful. surprised you can read that. It already a little bit of a read that. Oh, no. Okay. I mean, they couldn't have made the graphic any bigger no. than one and three. <laughs> no. uh, I got Minnesota and Iowa. I just think Minnesota has too much offense. I think Iowa is just, they're not scoring a lot of points. They're good defensively, but I think Minnesota wins this game. Wake Forest may be 7-2 and two on the year. They're playing Clemson. They will still get crushed like a grape, Todd. <laughs> I have Oklahoma and Baylor. I, too, really like Coach Rule. I hope Baylor wins this game in Waco. Game day is going to be down there. Quite an atmosphere. I think Jalen Hurts and Oklahoma is going to figure out the Bears. They've been having too many close calls. Josh, who do you got? Auburn true freshman quarterback Bo Nix has a combined completion percentage of 45 with six interceptions and just five touchdowns against the four ranked opponents he's faced this season. Georgia has the top ranked defense in the SEC. The Tigers will make it close, but I like the dogs to come out on top. He does all this detailed analysis. He still went just two and two last week. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the more you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so let's get into our keys of the game presented by our good friends at Blaze Alexander. Family dealerships, Todd, you get to go first. I talked earlier in the show about the secondary of the defensive backs getting their swagger back. I want the whole team to play with that edge, right? 60 minutes edge. Be personal. The loss was personal. Whatever you do, be motivated. Play with an edge the entire way against Indiana. Okay, I'll just go with two quick ones. Play with the lead like I always talk about. And you got to win the giveaway takeaway. I'm going to say this. Patience is going to be key. Indiana is going to hold the ball. Your offense is going to at times be on the sideline for a while. And there's yep. a there is a pressure to go in and try and score quickly. And Indiana's defense does not lend itself to that. So take what the defense gives you. Make the tackles on when you're on defense. And just be patient. You win by one. That's all that matters. And also part of the atmosphere is Penn State football is not just a game, it's an event. And our tailgate party is Saturday. Presented by our good friends at GoPSURV.com. Let Lot 18 adjacent to Beaver Stadium. Food, beverage, Blair Thomas is going to be there. Even a hot dog. <laughs> this is going to be great. For yep, Josh, enjoy. Todd, J.M. Steve. Green M&M's? I hope so. Better be.